Yeah, Aisha, we can show you those pictures uh, released by the Israelis saying that they show Benjamin Netanyahu on the ground in Gaza Strip. He's meeting and greeting troops, taking advantage of this truce, obviously. He reiterated the three main objectives of this Israeli offensive to bring home hostages, to destroy Hamas, and to make sure that this never happens again. I mean, there is, a, there is an element of theatrics to this. He is appealing. He's showing these pictures for, for, for a domestic audience in Israel. He wants to present himself after the awful attack and what happened on the 7th. He wants to present himself as the man getting the job done. And there is lots of pressure on him domestically because every day that goes by, every hostage released, Israeli society gets more of an appetite and becomes used to the relief and euphoria of hostages hostages being released and he really does not want to be the man that Israeli society blames for that stopping. And Parikh, just more information on that development. How is the hostage and prisoner exchange going at the moment? Yes, so far we're not hearing about any delays. It's happening as we speak. Uh, it's been confirmed that 14 Israelis and three foreign nationals, they have been handed over to the Red Cross and Red Crescent inside Gaza. They're making their way to the Rafa crossing. You re may remember that that exchange moment is the really sensitive moment in all of this. So everyone hoping that the day will continue as it did yesterday, as my colleague Minnie Stevenson reports. Holding the hands of Hamas militants, nine-year-old Emily Hand on the left and 12-year-old Hila Soshani, among 17 hostages released by Hamas. After fraught 11th hour diplomacy and a delay to free them, this cordial sounding farewell feeling all the more surreal. Bye now. Goodbye. Wake up. As they wave goodbye to their captors. After seven weeks held hostage, the relief palpable as nine-year-old Emily is finally reunited with her dad, Thomas. <laughs> On the night of October the 7th, the Irish-Israeli schoolgirl was at a sleepover when she was kidnapped. At one point, her dad was told his daughter had been killed. They just said, we found Emily. Uh, she's dead. In the Israeli hospital, where some of the hostages are being treated, with many more still being held captive, they choose their words carefully. Happy to say that despite the fact that the uh, harsh conditions they have been under and the um, experience of captivity, they did not um, require any emergent medical uh, intervention. While in the West Bank city of Al Barair, there are moments of joy. As the Israelis release 39 Palestinian prisoners. Among them, teenager Rohi Kazimir hugs his parents. His dad Yasser says he feels a mix of emotions. I feel happy, but this joy is intertwined with the blood of martyrs and the suffering of children and the elderly. In the West Bank, funerals are held after Palestinian health officials say at least eight people were killed by Israeli forces. Meanwhile, in Gaza, the temporary truce has allowed the largest delivery of aid since the start of the latest conflict, according to the UN, reaching areas in the north for the first time in a month. While today, Palestinians continue to carry the weariness of war, both sides making it clear this pause is anything but permanent. Well, earlier I spoke to Sharon Lifshitz, whose parents were both taken hostage by Hamas on October the 7th. Her mother was released on the 24th of October and famously shook the hands of her captor and wished them shalom. I began by asking Sharon whether she'd received any news about her father, who was still being held by Hamas. One of the hostages that came back actually told us that she saw him alive. So this is the first time we have confirmation that he arrived alive. Um, it's 51 days now, and we finally know that he did arrive alive. So that's great news. Obviously, he is not on the list at the moment. There is a long, long way to go. This is really, really a very fragile moment for everybody on so many levels. It's such a difficult time. When do you 
hear that someone is on the list or someone's not? How does that process even work? Oh, there is a lot of rumors and the the the, um, the officer that is uh, liaising on, on behalf of the family lets us know if our father is on the list and or not. So there's many rumors, but above all, there's a sense of great happiness for each person and each family that are united with some of their loved ones. It must be such a mix of emotions for you right now, seeing people getting out and then knowing that your own father still is possibly held hostage. I just wonder how you're feeling at the moment. Um, I feel on... I feel besides myself most of the time. Some of the time I can really relate to something, to the good news or to the fear that it will break. Above all, we feel very determined to continue because we still have over 200 hostages and um, the feeling among the family very strongly is that we all have to work together and raise as much awareness as possible so that uh, more and more people get uh, released. Um, and also, particularly at the moment, because this is the third night and four nights are confirmed, but there's very uh, clear possibility of more hostages being released in the following days. Our feeling is that everybody must come together at this point and do everything possible to release more of the hostages. Sharon, your mum came home um, earlier on, and I just wonder how she's been doing and how she's been able to process what she's been through. My mom is very, very sharp. She's uh, very much uh, involved in what is happening. She worked very hard over the last week with the authorities here in Israel, with the Ministry of Health, with the Ministry of uh, Interior to prepare for the return of the hostages. There's huge complexities to the situations. There are children who come back, but the parents were murdered. There's children who are still there. There's mothers that were stayed behind when the child was returned. All of us are going through an enormous trauma. She'll know more than anyone what those first days or first hours are like out of um, being a hostage. Um, I just wonder if she's managed to talk to others about what to expect, what to do and what can you do? It's about being very patient, giving back the sense of uh, control over one's life, because part of being a hostage is the total elimination of a sense of control over your being and your destiny and your actions. And just finally, Sharon, there's a sense of loss that people are reflecting on now that we've got this pause, the numbers of people who have died in Gaza as well. When you reflect, when you think about that, how do you feel right now? It fills me up with enormous sadness. It fills me up also with the feeling that there's so much trauma on both sides, so much loss of lives. I hope that when this uh, hor horrible episode is finished, something better can happen for the people of this region. We deserve better. Sharon Lachette, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Thousands of people have joined a march against anti-Semitism in London. On Friday, the Metropolitan Police said the number of anti-Semitic offences they'd recorded was up over a thousand percent compared to October last year. The organisers of today's march said it's a sad truth that Jews do not feel safe in our capital city. Jane Deeth reports. This was, organisers say, the biggest march against anti-Semitism in Britain since the 1930s. At the front, some famous faces and the chief rabbi. Feelings of sadness that it's necessary for us to stand here. Feelings of pride in the fact that there are so many Jewish people and so many friends of the Jewish people who recognise that a threat to the Jews is a threat to all of our society. The demonstrators were flanked by police. In London, in October, there was a tenfold increase in anti-Semitic offences compared to the same month last year. People said they were frightened to show they're Jewish. It's scary. I, I can't speak my language. I can't speak Hebrew. I have to be careful around who I am, like where I am. 
it's not it's not the best feeling but we have to show support we have to show that we care it feels scary that um, the tide seems to be turning against the Jewish people in this country it's all very worrisome because you know I'm nearly 80 so I don't like the idea but I'm going to come here and walk because I think we have to do that we have to say we exist Yesterday, pro-Palestinian demonstrators marched through the capital. 18 people were arrested for offences including inciting racial hatred. The campaign against anti-Semitism says anyone who marched alongside them is complicit. Ahead of today's march, some of your communication talked about those who perhaps marched yesterday calling for support for the Palestinians as being complicit in anti-Semitism. A lot of people on that march would feel very hurt by that, including Jewish people. So, well, look, if um, you march for seven weeks alongside people who are calling for the elimination of the State of Israel, who threaten Jews, who are caught on video saying things like Hitler was right and you do nothing about it, then what are we meant to think? You know, occasionally at our events, we get people from the far right who turn up. When they do turn up, we have them removed. And today the police did remove the former leader of the English Defence League, Tommy Robinson. He tried to join the march, even though organisers said they didn't want him or his supporters anywhere near the event. The Met said it had arrested a 40-year-old man for refusing to comply with a direction to disperse. Bring them home! Bring them home! The demonstrators continued towards Parliament. The organisers estimate 60,000 people were here, saying no to anti-Semitism.